Welcome to our March Ladies Who Lunch Conversations. Um, in doing my research for this month's special guest, Andrea Clearfield, who I'll bring in in a minute, I found that it's also March's Music in the Schools Month. So this is all um, a celebration to, uh, and an homage, I should say, to Andrea. And um, I'll read her bio in just a second, so Bill can show you some of the table, Bill, my Marty Scorsese, <laughs> uh, that I often call him because he's so good with the camera work. And um, you'll see that I have lots of music notes and um, little guitars and, you know, fun things like that um, that really uh, highlight how music is so important in our lives. This you'll see I put on the uh, uh, on my um, blog and also in the pages that it shows um, my brother, he makes these renderings. They're all hand done, you know, all the music uh, notes, which is just fantastic. Uh, but we had the pleasure of going to lunch with Andrea when we were in Philadelphia um, for the, uh, the Horticultural Society, the flower show. So we went to lunch there and it was just great to be able to meet her. You know, music is all about orchestration and networking, so I've been having a ball just even writing about it. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm an author, a writer. Um, my blog is Garden Glamour. I'll put that up later. These are some of my books here. And, uh, and while we're waiting for Andrea, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about her. I met her through the connection through my brother, who does these renderings, but he's a, a Grammy Award-winning artist himself and has played with Andrea at her a salon that we'll tell you about in a few minutes. So uh, Andrea is a uh, musician, she's a composer, she's a pianist, and she's the founder and curator of her very own salon. She is a very deeply emotive musical musician, and uh, I see her coming on here, so let me just see if I can bring us both on together at the same time. Let's see. I'm just reading your bio here, Andrea, so I'm giving people a little bit of the background to you. There we go. Uh, I'm talking about how uh, you're a musician, a composer, a pianist, the founder and curator of Salon, that you create these deeply emotive musical languages that build cultural and artistic bridges. And the music of Andrea Clearfield is performed widely in the U.S. and abroad. She has written 160 works for opera, chorus, orchestra, chamber ensemble, dance, and multimedia. Among her works are 16 cantatas, including one for the Philadelphia Orchestra. She's been awarded a Pew Center International Residency Award, a Pew Fellowship in the Arts, two Independence Foundation Fellowships, and fellowships at the Rockefeller's Bellagio Center, American Academy in Rome, Yaddo, McDowell and Copland House, among others. And she, Andrea sits on the boards of the Recording Academy, the Grammys Philadelphia chapter, as well as Wildflower Composers. And she really helps amplify the voices of females and gender expansive uh, composers. And what I really love and what I learned from our lunch, we'll talk about that in a minute, is that she's really very passionate about creating community around the arts. She also seems like a very good friend but uh, her salon, that we'll talk about a little bit at the end also, um, and the link is, um, the next one is this Sunday, March 26th, and you can be there live or you can live stream it. Um, and right now what we're listening to is very special, and I feel really glad that we're able to uh, share a little bit in the background, but I'll also have a link to it. But it's a premiere performance of her music, Earth Door, Sky Door, that was commissioned from Angel Fire. So you can learn more about this um, when I put the notes up, you know, on the ladies' lunch. So that is a long introduction, uh, but you have a very um, uh, story, illustrious career, Andrea. So first of all, I want to say, uh, ladies' who lunch, welcome to you. I was able Thank to you. give my special fork to Andrea when we were down in Philadelphia, so I hope you're enjoying that as well. So I know you have a lot going on, so we're very, very happy that you were able to join us. So maybe you can tell us first just a little bit about the music that's in the background that I'll be uh, putting up. Thank you so much, Leanne. It's really a delight and an honor to be here today on your program. And um, thank you for 
uh, streaming in this music. Uh, this door piece, Earth Door, Sky Door, I wrote in 2018, it was commissioned by a wonderful music in New Mexico, Ida and it's written for a chamber ensemble of and it's inspired by some of the work that I had done documenting Tibetan music in the Himalayas in northern Nepal. And even though the music doesn't sound Tibetan, the theme itself inspired me. There is um, a, uh, it's like, um, looks like the Native American dream catcher, and the Tibetans call it the Sago Namgo, which translates as earth door, sky door. And like the dream catcher, it kind of seduces and captures negative energies so that the positive energies can pass through. So mm -hmm. it essentially it closes the doors to that which isn't wanted. And I thought, oh, what an interesting idea to kind of expound upon the mysteries of the creative process, how some doors open, others close, how some ideas will reveal a lot of possibility and other ideas get left behind. And kind of like our lives, you know, some doors open and we can manifest our dreams and other doors close, but then they lead us to new doors that open. So this piece explores those doors in the creative and life process. That's just beautiful. That's just beautiful. So much element. I have to ask, when did you know that you wanted to become a musician? I mean, is it something like you talk about doors opening and closing? Was it like an abrupt, like you opened up and said, that's it, I'm going to be a musician? Or how did it evolve? It, it seemed to be a very natural process. Um, my parents, who my father is a retired physician and my mother is a painter, uh, and they both have a profound love of music and would play music in our home. And so I just grew up with music in the living room. And when I was, I think, five years old, I came home from school and started to play on my, my mother's piano some melodies that I had heard at school and I had figured them out. And so my parents decided to give me piano lessons. And it wasn't until a little bit later that I started to write my own music although I didn't really know that I was a composer. In fact, back then, um, I didn't know that women could be composers. So I just <laughs> thought I was making things and I'd invite my friends over to play them. Wow, that's fantastic that you even knew how to write music. Usually uh, young students are just struggling to, uh, you know, just to rehearse and practice and practice. Um, did So, you know, oftentimes, you know, parents, good parents, especially like yours, they want their children to be exposed to the arts and uh, to embrace that. But then when it comes time to have a career, they often want you to do something else in order to make money. Was there any kind of conflict like that that you experience? Or, you know, they say pursue your dreams until the rubber hits the road kind of thing. <laughs> For sure. I think my parents were a little bit worried. You know, it was one thing to major in music in undergraduate school, but then when I wanted to go on and get my graduate degree and my doctorate degree in music, um, I think there was some concern, well, how are you going to do this? And I remember telling my parents, you know, just um, trust me, this is my passion and my calling and I'll find a way. And now they're my biggest fans. <laughs> Yay. Um, I know. Uh, when my brother plays, my mother is going to be 98. She wants to go to every performance. I'm like, it's a job. We can't go to everything, but we would love <laughs> to. But I feel like in this time of, you know, pandemic and post-pandemic that people really can uh, be in more places to experience the arts or, you know, museums or things like that. But as, um, as you were coming up um, in your career, did you experience any uh, resistance um, being a female or any misogyny that was sort of built into the system? You know, I, I didn't, um, and maybe I just wasn't aware of it. Um, I, feel, I just feel really fortunate that I met a mentor um, while I was in college, Margaret Garwood, a great composer mm -hmm. of opera and vocal music, and I even transferred from one college to another to study with her. And wow. she she really led the way. Um, she was unique in her generation and that she was really 
um, you know, making her work very um, visible at that time. And she stood by me and she just said, listen to your own voice and you'll always know what to do. Nobody can take that from you. And so I always think of her. She was my mentor for 40 years until she passed in uh, just a few years ago. And so I feel very, very fortunate to have somebody who was really um, the guiding light and that I could follow in her, in her footsteps. You really are. Do you have that sense from her or was it just innate that you, it seems like you always want to play it forward or pay it forward uh, to others and do you mentor uh, musicians today? I do. And, and I think about her all the time. I think, Peg, you know, you, you, you gave so much to me and, and I'd like to pay it forward to other musicians, young musicians. I'm on the board of this wonderful organization called Wildflower Composers that you mentioned um, for female and gender expansive young composers to, um, to have mentors and performance possibilities and all kinds of educational opportunities. And, um, and I just, uh, a lot of people contact me and they, they want to know how to make a living in music. And I'm, I'm so happy to be able to talk to them and at least tell them my story and right. fire them. So getting right down into it, like as a career, I mean, maybe you can tell the viewers, I mean, you wear a lot of different hats. I mean, I, it, I think this is very true of many people who are working today they have a side hack or they do this or that but yours is all encompassing around music but besides uh, you told us you were a teacher you're a performer and a, a composer so let's see if we can unpack that a little bit and just ask how does one um, get you to compose music what's that process um, so I work on commission and generally that would be say um, a patron of the arts or an organization or a musician um, that will ask me to write a piece. And generally these pieces have some kind of um, parameters like, you know, will you write a 12 minute piece for French horn and piano? Will you write a 20 minute piece for orchestra? Um, sometimes they have themes built in, especially if I'm writing for the voice. So the commission might be on a particular theme. And I, I love the challenge of researching and learning and making these themes uh, meaningful for myself and hopefully the listeners. So, um, so there's always a process of collaboration with the commissioner, which I really enjoy. Um, and then I'll go into my studio and work for months or even years in some cases on a piece. And then, it's, um, then it has its world premiere. Um, so that seems like a luxury to be able to work on a piece of art for years. I mean, authors do the same. I know I do the same too. But if someone says to you, um, making this up, but if they say, I want, um, we have a centennial coming up and we'd like you to uh, compose a piece for it, but I need it uh, in six months. Is that something that you can do? Or do you say, no, I need unlimited time? Um, I actually like the challenge, um, unless it's impossible. <laughs> you know, I did it next week. I don't think there's any way I could do that. But I, I do like the challenge. And it, um, you know, it kind of, um, it, it's a kickstart for me to, mm. to, to mm. Show up every day and to do the work and to, you know, and to listen and receive and hopefully the music are, uh, are happy. <laughs> Right. I mean, I just uh, finished reading a book by Ann Patchett, and I see that she was at Kennedy Center of the Arts a, as a recipient, so I love that. But the book was Bel Canto, and I won't go into the storyline, but it was based on a true story. But as an opera singer, she has to practice every day, you know, long practices, even in this captivity that was in the story as a hostage. But So you're writing, but what about your playing? Do you have to practice every day to stay in fighting form, stay in shape? Uh, if I have a big concert coming up, then I do. I'd say that my um, my priorities have shifted a little bit. I, I used to do a whole lot of performing. I'm still a pianist. Um, but the creative urge um, became more powerful for me to face the blank page and to ask myself, you know, what has meaning that wants to be created? And it's not that I don't enjoy it. I love it. Um, but I'm not playing as much. Um, 
of the of the big solo repertoire. So when I do have a concert, you know, I think hopefully um, my fingers remember and I'll practice. Mm -hmm. I'll practice for several weeks leading up to it. So say if you're, you've produced a composition for a patron, you come in, do you recommend the musicians or do they have their own uh, in terms of the premiere and the performances? It's happened both ways. Um, sometimes the commission is in um, conjunction with an already existing ensemble and they have a premiere in mind and they have um, their core musicians or their um, their ensemble that I would be working with and other times they'll ask me for suggestions they'll say who who do you think would be the best soprano for this role mm -hmm. I was thinking of how like I was saying earlier that you know by its definition music is an orchestration you're working you're networking so I was thinking how you you know, may network your own uh, personal contacts, uh, you know, in the music world. Yeah, I think, you know, it's funny because a lot of um, young people will talk to me about how can I get my music out there? Mm -hmm. And I suppose I'm sort of old school, even though I'm, I'm on social media. I really believe in going out and listening to concerts mm -hmm. and seeing what resonates with you and what stirs you inside. And then if something stirs you to, to go and meet the performers and, and make right. relationships with them. Of course, that can also be done online, but I'm, you know, as I said, I, I love the in-person um, experience of being at concerts. So uh, I try to get out and support my colleagues, and hear what they're writing and what they're performing and just kind of staying in touch with the music of today and the music in uh, the Philadelphia scene as well. I know. How, so it, it always seems, like even though you're engaged with a lot of different musical genres, that you're more classical. Um, and so then I, you know, it sort of begs the question, I mean, some people say that, um, you know, classical music is from yesteryear, and today we have more jazz or hip hop or, you know, whatever. So how do you answer that? I mean, I always felt you needed a more educated, um, listener for classical music, but when it's not in the schools or uh, people aren't going to, uh, you know, the symphonies, uh, how do you keep the next generation engaged? That's a great question, Leanne. Um, you know, first of all, I just want to backtrack, you know, classical, you can look at it two ways, right? There was a historical period of classical music, Mozart and Haydn and early and, and then there's the overarching theme of classical, which generally refers to concert music or you know, of the quality of music. Maybe in the past it was music that was notated or that required a lot of focus to listen to or mm. was quote serious. I think now there is this exciting and really vital wave of new classical music mm. that we don't have a definition for um, that incorporates all kinds of influences, world music, jazz, hip hop, you know, R&B. And it's, it's so exciting to see these different, um, different genres and styles and art forms coming together mm -hmm. so that we don't even know what classical music is at the moment because it's just constantly changing. Um, I would call it the, the creative new music that's being written today that is a result of being alive today and, and that we're hearing and experiencing. I love that. I love the way you're saying it's a whole new kind of a genre. So maybe briefly you can describe, because I know it was like a, a long um, involved process, but how you got to Tibet to help create, you know, create your composition. So that seems like a rare opportunity. That was an incredible experience, Leanne. Um, I, I actually was in the Tibetan Plateau, which is in northern Nepal, just over the border of Tibet. Um, so I was talking a little bit earlier about commissions and how they happen and, and, and how I, I love the challenge of the, the different themes or parameters that these commissions come with. And in 2008, I was approached by Network for New Music, which is a really fine new music ensemble here in Philadelphia. And their artistic director at the time, Linda Reichert, had this vision for a whole season that paired composers and visual artists to create something together. And I was paired with Maureen Durdak, a really dynamic 
uh, local artist who gets her inspiration from Tibetan Buddhist iconography. And she was going on a trek to a very remote region um, where to do research for her artwork and to gather clay and to mm -hmm. study. <laughs> and she took me by surprise when she said, well, I'm going on this trek for my own research. Why don't you come? and from this shared experience, we'll create something together. Mm. And um, I remember going home and saying to myself, self, <laughs> are you ready for your life to change? And I got this big yes inside. Um, and so I went, um, not really knowing that it would be f five days on horseback over 10 mountain passes and into one of the last remaining enclaves of traditional Tibetan culture in the world. Um, so one thing led to another, and I ended up um, recording the royal court singer Tashit Sering along with an anthropologist and helping to preserve his repertoire. Um, and at the same time, uh, that trek and another one a couple of years later really changed my my life and and my belief in the the confirmation of music that has this power to bring us all together. It really does. And I, you know, wrote on my blog today that, you know, music is seemingly or arguably different from the other arts and that it permeates all of the other artistic endeavors. So I think it has that, that power, you know, to move us. And um, I find, you know, you're so delightful, of course, and beautiful, but it's your enthusiasm for the music. And I think that's transporting in and of itself um, that helps move people and get them excited, you know, about your music and what you're doing. So I have two other quick, sort of quick questions. But if you, um, for someone starting out, uh, it could be a boy or a girl, a young man or young woman, but particularly women, what advice would you give them um, in pursuing a career in music? And what instrument? You know, walking around the streets of New York, you know, I always feel that the folks with the um, wind instruments, like my cousins play the oboe and things. Um, Justine probably, she's, it's a lot easier than carrying around like a bass fiddle or something like that. So how do you choose your, your, your path, your journey, and then your instrument? Well, I think um, that the instrument, no matter how large or small, should be something that the youth gravitate towards because they like something about it. They're attracted to the sound, they're excited by the shape or you know, they've heard somebody play it and you know, they wanna be like them. I think it really needs to come from that, that impulse of being excited about something. So um, there isn't a particular instrument that I recommend, although I do find playing the piano very helpful because you can play with other performers as a, a collaborative artist and you can learn a lot of repertoire and have a lot of great experiences that way and then you can also play through musical scores as a way to learn them so i think piano is is a, a really fantastic instrument to learn although as i said if you're drawn to something else then by all means go there go go for your your heart and your your ears are leading you. <laughs> right. And I think you're, so that's really good advice uh, to be able to share and to pass on and life lessons in general, I guess. But um, also for your salon, so how you keep up this rigorous schedule and showcase, is it new talent, existing talent, different talent? Maybe you could tell us a little bit about that and then um, I'll give the, um, you know, where folks can go for this Sunday, March 26th, your next one. Sure, thank you so much for, for mentioning it. So um, in addition to composing, I also um, started a salon concert series in 1986, going all that time, 36 years now. Um, it's changed over the pandemic and now it's a hybrid. So it's both live here um, in my loft with an audience and it's also live streamed in an interactive Zoom so that people who are watching can clap and they can respond and there, there are ways to engage with the artists because I wanted to keep it as close to the house concert as possible when we went into lockdown. Um, and That's so very I, different that people can interact. Usually they're blocking. So kudos to you and your technicians that make it feel like you're very uh, much a 
like being there with you. Yeah, shout out to my incredible engineer team. They worked hard to create an entirely new system here. And it's just amazing because we're streaming everything out, but we're also streaming in. Yes. So to answer your question about the programming, um, when I started in 1986, the idea was 10 ensembles or, or performers each has 10 minutes. Um, this was before iPod Shuffle. <laughs> And I was thinking, oh, how wonderful it would be if we could put all these different styles and genres, jazz, classical, world music, multimedia, dance, spoken word, electronics, all under one roof, so to speak, in one concert. Um, because at that time, you know, people were off in, you know, more sort of boxes. And I, I just had this strong impulse to want to bring together a diverse programming, which also brings a cross fertilization of audience because mm. people might come to hear their favorite, um, you know, um, uh, Peruvian flute ensemble, and then they get to hear Puccini opera for the first time. So, um, so now I program seven live ensembles here and they're streamed out. Um, and then I program in three, approximately three, sometimes four remote ensembles from around the world and the United States who couldn't be here in person, but they're performing live. So last month I had a fabulous classical guitarist from the Netherlands. It was about 2.30 in the morning and she's performing live for us. Um, this, this Sunday we'll have a, a beautiful dancer, Lena Fischbeck, who will be performing from France. And um, so that's been a really exciting outgrowth of, or silver lining, so to speak, of the pandemic. I think so too. And I love um, how you describe the cross fertilization of the audience, because sometimes you don't know what you don't know, but if you're there and you're not with your usual tribe, you're exposed to something. So uh, it, it really is educational in a very um, artful way. So um, congratulations to you for that. Uh, so if people want to see, I'll put it in the description, but it's um, the performance is at 730 and you can go to your um, website, which is the same as your name. So like here's your, for everyone, that's your Instagram, but your website is the same, andreaclearfield.com, right? That's correct. Yeah. And there's another website just for the salon. It's called Zalon Arts, Z-A-L-O-N arts.org. Um, and that also has the program and the artist bios and the link um, where you can join um, the audience starts coming into the Zoom room and also the loft at 7 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And then the performances start at 7.30. And then what's at 9.30? There's something else that there's a chat with the artist? Yeah, I like to have these conversations. Well, like we're having um, yeah. between the artists and the audience. Again, just sort of breaking down. Um, barriers so that people in the audience can ask the artist, what was your inspiration for that piece? Or, or how has your music changed during the pandemic? Or what led you to play this unusual instrument? Or can you tell us more about that technique? And I think those discussions for me are, are really important to have that kind of engagement and curiosity and open-mindedness from the audience. And the performers love it because they they get to to really speak about what um, what drives them. I couldn't agree more. I mean, you know, as a writer, but I it's I, people respond to the story. They want to know what's behind it, and that's you know part of the success of the ladies who lunch conversation is that what inspires you know people like you who are leaders uh, who are such talents. So. So I'm looking forward to the chat on Sunday. That's going to be fantastic, you know, with the artist. But uh, sort of one last question, because I can't believe we're out of time already. But um, what can, what's on your, you know, you're always coming up with new and different ideas, it seems. So what's on your horizon? What's in the future? And what continues to inspire you as you look forward? Oh, uh, um, yeah, so many ideas, so little time. <laughs> um, I am just writing some proposals for a piece that I want to write. Um, 
uh, on Sephardic music, which is just this beautiful haunting music um, that combines um, Middle Eastern and Spanish and comes from the Jewish diaspora um, when the Jews were expelled from Spain. And um, it has there's something about that music that just moves me so deeply. So I'd like to write a symphony that is inspired by different um, different places in um, the Jewish diaspora that um, where Sephardic music is being performed and um, write a first piano and symphony orchestra. So I'm working on some uh, grant proposals for that and a couple of uh, big projects that um, I can't talk about now, but if you subscribe to my newsletter, uh, you'll find out about them soon. Well, that sounds absolutely heavenly. Um, mm -hmm. And music is like a dream, so we'll keep dreaming. Um, we're gonna look forward to the Salon this Sunday, March 26th. And it goes every month, is that right? Or is it? Once a month, uh, September through May. So hopefully people can you know, subscribe <laughs> and just come back monthly and then see live. And also, I just want to add, I purchased some of the music and some of the music that you're hearing. There's Convergence, different ones, but you can find Andre's music on um, iTunes or you can also find it on uh, Sound... Uh, SoundScan? Sound, oh. SoundCloud. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then there, yeah. there are a bunch of recordings on my website, andreaclearfield.com. If you just go to the menu that says record all of the CDs um, that you can download. It's, it's beautiful there and has all the discography, all the explanations and things like that. So um, we love to support our um, artists. So I don't know, I can't thank you enough for taking the time and enlightening us and being so inspiring. Thank you so much, Leanne. I really feel privileged to be here. And yes. I would just like to say that I believe that the arts can transform us and that they can bring us close to one another, bring us close to our souls. And um, that's one of the reasons why I continue doing what I do. It really does. I remember, um, I think it was one of the films we saw, but we talked about the um, arts, you know, and when, when, when people go to war to protect uh, their country or their place, it's what unites them is their culture. And the biggest part of our culture is the arts. That's what makes us and our community and our memories. So, you know, I salute you. <laughs> Cheers. You, cheers. All right. We'll see you on Sunday at the salon. See you then. Bye-bye.